Welcome to the Sport Exchange with me, John Robbie. Hi guys, it's John Robbie here. Welcome to the Sport Exchange podcast where we meet celebrities and personalities from from different sports. We hear their stories, the good, the bad and the ugly and learn how they deal with the transition from playing to enjoying the rest of their lives. Each week I'll discuss my most recent article and we hope to have a lot of fun. Enjoy. Today we welcome a man who holds the South African record for Super Rugby appearances and who captained the Springboks through some of their darkest days Then he retired from international rugby but is he back? Adrian Strauss, welcome to you. Welcome to the pod, to the Sport Exchange podcast. Hi, John. And uh, yeah, thanks for having me on. It's great to have a chat with you. Are you back? <laughs> <laughs> no, to be honest with you, you know, when I retired, it wasn't an easy decision. Um, it was a really tough decision because the pinnacle of rugby, not only, you know, being a South African, but the pinnacle of rugby for me is playing for the box. So it wasn't an easy decision. Um, and, you know, but I, but, I, but I made that step and I took that step. And, you know, I, I wouldn't take it lightly to go back and play for the box. I would only do it, you know, if they really needed me or, for, or if I can help them out. And I, I think there's a lot of talent in the country. You know, a lot of young hookers now, uh, knowing that Malcolm was a bit injured. But, you know, Busy is in the group as well. And he brings that experience. And, um, you know, I played with him a lot of games. And uh, I've got a lot of respect for him. And Malcolm's there. And, you know, you got Akker and, and other youngsters coming up. And I think it's uh, very important to... To get them through the structures as well and give them opportunity to play. So I don't, I don't think it's actually necessary for me to be there at the moment. You, you have, um, you haven't answered my question. <laughs> uh, ha, have there been discussions? Have, they, have they chatted to you? Are you available? Um, to be honest with you, not at the moment. I haven't chatted to 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 Russ or anything like that. So, and I think that will set for for the English series. I'm not exactly sure when Malcolm would be back. But like I said, I also think it's important for, for the World Cup next year that, that other guys do get opportunities and they do play um, if anything was to happen. Or they, you know, there's the, you've always got the risk of injury. So it's a good opportunity to give guys an opportunity, a chance to play. All right. You look like you're enjoying your rugby. I mean, you look like you've just got a new lease of, of life. Where, where, where are you at the moment in your head? I'm loving rugby at the moment. Uh, I've had a, I've been a professional player now for 15 years, and to be honest with you, I loved most of uh, of my career in playing rugby. Uh, like you mentioned, there was a tough year <laughs> and a half, but I also enjoyed some of that, and it was a massive honour. And you know, I wouldn't, still wouldn't change it, and I accepted that responsibility, and I knew full, you know. I've, uh, I knew well what what I got myself into. I I didn't expect it to be as tough, you know, or the the results be as bad as they were. But I I did the best I could. I'm proud of a lot of things I did, and um, you know I gave it my all. So, but to be honest with you, I enjoy I, I love the game. So I enjoyed most of my career. Tell us tell us about those days. I mean, to play for the box is amazing. To play international rugby, then to be made captain of your your team beyond your wildest dreams. But to play for the box when the things are going badly is 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 dreadful. Tell us about the darkest days. I th- yeah, the, the darkest days. It, it was quite tough, but you know, I always just try to um, to hold on to my integrity and do things you know that that I know will benefit the team. I, I know when things go tough, you know, people tend to to look out for themselves, and I and I always you know when I got up in the mornings, I, I did that cliche that I I really looked myself in the mirror and made sure that my heart's in the right place. Um, that I'm doing it for, you know, for the best interest of the team in South African rugby and whatever that, you know, whatever needed to be done, you know, that was in the best interest of the team, I would do that. So um, I also played as hard as I could. We didn't function that well. Um, we weren't that great on the field. Um, what went wrong? I don't think it's that that simple. I don't think it's there's a simple answer mm. to that. But uh, but you must have you know, thought of it. You must yeah, have thought no, of it. I've thought of it quite a lot. And, you know, I always knew it was going to be tough because it's a transition year after a World Cup. But then um, the Irish test, I don't think we, you know, we had enough preparation um, or we were actually ready to go into that test or, or, or felt like, you know, we were a well-oiled machine, whereas they, they, they've been playing together, um, the quality side. Um, I know it was at home for us, but um, I always knew that was going to be tough. And I think we did all right. Um, it was I, a- I remember because obviously coming from Ireland originally, uh, I, I took a great deal of interest in that. Yeah. And I think it was the second test, the last 15 minutes. You guys were fantastic. There was there was one stage where you looked like you just gelled and I thought everything's going to be okay. Do you remember that? 
I, yeah, I definitely remember that. And I think one of the moments was Ruan Komring's uh, try as well. Um, you know, that sparked everyone. It gave everyone, you know, ignited everyone. So there was a lot of good moments and, and it got us on the roll. But I think after that, in the championship, um, we just couldn't take that step forward. And I think we actually took a step backwards and we, and we didn't grow as a group. We actually, uh, I think... Um, yeah, we stagnated and it cost us dearly. Did you fragment at all? Did you ever feel that there were cliques? Because in the past, when a, a Springbok side has, has done badly, and there have been periods when they've done badly, think of the mid-60s, think of the 70s, etc. Yeah. Um, the provincial players tended to go off on their own, etc. Did you ever feel that happening? Happening? I don't actually feel it that badly. I think it will always happen. But to be honest with you, I don't think it was a massive issue that there was too many clicks. I think too, there were too many clicks. I think um, there was a lot of frustration because everyone was in it. We were working quite hard and, and everyone wanted to turn this thing around and we, we just couldn't do it. So um, I think the, the biggest blow of the year was definitely Italy. Um, that really, uh, or in my opinion, you know, when we got to the Northern Hemisphere. Wales was pretty bad. I was there in Cardiff. That was a shocking performance. Wales was pretty bad as well, I think. Um, but but we needed to be at least better against Italy and Wales every single game. But, I mean, that was a big blow. And that was a, every single loss is a big blow for me personally as well. But I think that was the biggest one of the year. Um, to realize to what level, you know, Springbok rugby and that year has sunk to. Um, I think that was quite... A shocker for how, me. how much did it hurt to see, obviously, Alistair Katsia being slammed, the coach, and then your captaincy being slammed, your playing being slammed, etc.? Did you ever lose it? Did you ever, you know, break things? <laughs> no, to be honest with you, I, I, when, you know, while we were still playing and throughout the year, you know, when you're in a situation like that, I tend to, you know, fight as hard as I can. And I think it actually, when, when it was all done i think then it was then when it's really set in you know a week or two after the end of the year and we had that discussions with this rugby and see how we can you know give input and, and and help things going forward so i think that week after everything has settled down then it actually um you don't realize it then you realize it throughout the year where you are but i think then the emotion really kicks in but throughout the year there's no time for that you know i just fought as hard as i could and, and alistair could see her, did he get a rough deal I think he, he, you know, I can't speak about 2017 at all. Mm. Uh, in my opinion, I think they did a lot better. And I, I, I really thought that they would. And, and I think they made a step up. It was a tough start for him, to be honest. Um, like I said, we were, in a bit, we were in sixes and sevens there in the beginning. It's no... But you won a series against Ireland, who we now know are one of the best teams in the world. They've possibly got the best coach in the world in, in, in Joe jo Schmidt. I mean, surely it was a good start in hindsight. Yeah, like I said, you know, I don't think we played that well and I don't think it was a great start. But like I said, it was a decent way to get the season off after a transition year. And after that, we needed to, to you know, to do to do better. Um, and then we just couldn't. Um, uh, we just couldn't get it together and we couldn't take that step forward. So, And then as the pressure came on, and or not the pressure, but... Um, I just think we deteriorated, actually. Mm. The, the, I mean, what, what used to bug so many people was, and of course the pr media pressure is huge. It's lovely to talk to the media when you're winning, but when you're losing, it's, it's, it, it, it's a bind. And we kept hearing how well you were training, kept hearing how well you were preparing, kept hearing how well everything was going, and then we'd get Italy and we'd get Wales and, and so on. How difficult was it fronting up? Uh, fronting up to fronting the, up to the media to the as media. captain it, as it, captain as captain it was quite tough but i always you know i always when uh, always faced them um i always asked to face them especially in the tough times you know when there wasn't a lot of people i didn't want to put anyone else on the spot or you know i, I thought that if especially when it's tough it's my responsibility to face them so i did that and it, it's not easy you know and there's only so many words that you can describe at the end of the yeah. season what's going on so it becomes a situation where you really um you repeat yourself in a lot of things and it it, it gets i can i can think that it gets irritating to hear but a lot of the things were true and then um, all of them were true but i mean and um i know people want to hear the answer and the only answer and the exact answer if there was anything like that then you know we would have changed it and we would have won so um, it's not always as easy working with a lot of people in a big group and a big dynamic. So, yeah. T tell us about being made captain, because there was some controversy about that that developed about whether you in fact said you were going to retire 
at the end of the year. I remember it was a bizarre situation, and I think in a way it got swept under the carpet. Tell us about how you were made captain and what was said and what wasn't. Yeah, you know, there's no controversy over that at all. Uh, Coach Alistair called me in and he asked me in Stellenbosch if um, if he asked me to be captain, if I if I was willing to you know to to do it, and I told him that you know it's a massive honour and I would definitely do it, and it would be yeah you don't you dream of playing for the Springboks, you don't dream of becoming captain. So it's it's beyond my dreams. It was beyond my dreams, and the only thing I asked him is it must be fine with the so-called senior players yeah. so there wasn't a group of senior players but I just felt like you know the guys and the senior guys and the guys that's been there they must really be comfortable with that so mm. as far as I know he had a conversation with them or with a group who I don't know and you know they were quite keen so um, that was important for me because I, I know I knew that I needed um, needed buy-in from everyone and I needed support and um, yeah, so for, it was actually a good start for me knowing that, that I had the backing of the guys and, and did you say look I'm retiring in a year no I didn't say that I did that in the championship I told I had a conversation with coach Alistair and I told him I don't know if I'm going to be there in 2019 what changed your mind then because presumably when you started off you were looking at playing as, as, as long as you could I was looking to play as long as I could but I also you know in my first media conference that was also in Stellenbosch I said it's a week by week thing and mm. um, it sounds sometimes it sounds a bit airy fairy but I really I really stick to the fact that if it's not something's not the best for the team, then I can't. You know, if I, I had a four-year contract with the box and I only played a year, and I had to give three, no, I had to give. I gave three years back, and you know, I thought of it as give a youngster opportunity, um, make sure he stays in South Africa, use that money, utilize it. I could have hanged on there for, you know, just try and be in the group for. But three there must years have been salary. more to it than that. You're captain of the box, <laughs> and you're suddenly saying, I mean, was it? I heard you were injured. Of course, you had a back injury. I know yeah. that you ended up losing a lot of weight, etc. With a business interest, with a family interest, whatever. To give up the Springbok international rugby at the height of your career is a very strange thing to do. Yeah, I think maybe for you it is. For me, it was the right thing to do, and um, the reasoning behind that the the. Uh, the number one reason is I didn't think that I would go to the 2019 World Cup. Ah. Because of my back, um, I really, uh, because of a lot of factors, but I just felt physically that I, I wouldn't be able to make it. And the year before that, you know, especially after the World Cup, you think you can and all of that, but I really struggled physically. Um, I knew there were still three, th four years left to the World Cup, and I thought that I wouldn't be able to make it. So, um I took the captaincy on as a as a as a, I took the responsibility, but I also told Coach Alistair that I don't know if I'm going to be there. So throughout this year, I'll I'll, I'll definitely take the captaincy. What was his reaction? I think he was quite. I can't say disappointed. I think he was quite sad. Mm. I think he was quite sad. Um, but it's also the the main idea for me was also to help Bongi and Malcolm and those guys come through. Um, and I actually thought in 2016 they would actually play some more. They did get opportunities and things didn't work out that well. So then I played a bit more in 2016. I think they're all great players. And I mean, even in 2016, you know, I think it was quite clear and obvious that in 2019, um, they will be the weakest playing. So. T tell us um, about your selection. Let's go back to the better days. You have yeah. the, the moment you first realized you're going to be a, a spring back. I mean, I, let, we've dealt with tough stuff now, yeah. okay? Uh, but, but tell us about the early selections, when you were first told, because you suddenly, in a way, burst onto the scene. You know, your blondy hair was there. You were very, very dynamic, etc. Your line-out throwing was always magnificent, etc. But to go from being just a promising player to a spring back, tell us about that. Yeah, that was, it was very exciting. I got the call up and played in 2008 against the Aussies um, in Perth. And it was just, you know, I played with, with guys that I, you know, that Lisha, I watched them on TV. Yeah. And they were actually my hero. So now I'm standing in a circle with them before a test match and uh, looking around me. I, I was in awe and it was a massive honor for me. And I don't, I don't get it. Well, I don't feel the nerves before a game, actually. But I think that. The, Maybe once or twice in my career, and that was definitely one of them that I felt it, and I was I was so excited. Tell us about scrummaging, because I, I, we were chatting earlier, um, and and there's only six people know what happens in a scrum, and all of them are liars. <laughs> okay, <laughs> Ted, talk us through a scrum. You're playing against the All Blacks or the I don't know Crusaders or whatever. 
when you put your arms out and your 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 your, your front row comes together, you feel the locks in behind, etc. Talk us through a scrum. What goes through your mind when you are talking about a competitive scrum in a competitive yeah. game? Because that's something I think nobody other than those six knows knows about. Yeah, I, I love scrum time just because um, individually you can be as good as you want to. It's it's a team effort, you know. It's it's absolutely about synergy. It's it's about generating a lot of power and um, holding good shape. And if you've got any crack there, um, any guy not pulling his weight, um, you know that that'll show because it's uh, the pressure build up is, is quite immense. So you know. When but when you say the pressure build up, where does it come first? Does it come in your arms first? Then is it your legs? Then is it your back? Give give me more. I think it, you know it's changed as well. Um, but the technicalities, I think these days the hit is very important. Um, after the hit, it must be stable. So you need to generate a great hit um, that comes from the front row, but a lot of power comes from the back as well. And um, after the hit, you need to manage it because then the scrum needs to be stable. Otherwise, you give away a free kick. So to get that hit and to explode into it, but then also to be able to to manage it so that you don't give away the free kick, reload, and then after the ball is in, you know, it's you want to get an explosion. Yeah. But you also want it very controlled. So you want to tighten up and tighten up because the longer you stay in that fight, the, the more the pressure builds. And um, you know that's that's when the shape and all of that's so important. Uh, Philip Orr, who played for the Lions, was a was a, a, a provincial mate of mine. He said that good scrummaging in a front row, you feel like you're sitting on a wall. <laughs> he said, does that does that, does that resonate yeah, with you? It's, it's quite accurate, I think. Um, you know, I've quite often had guys next, to, you know, props or. You know, I've heard a guy snore next to me when he literally just passed out. And you know, I've, been, I've been close to that as well. So I just love the challenge of that because, um, like I say, it's, it's you individually. Um, technically, you need to be sound. And you've got, especially in the front row, you've got a guy opposite of you that you don't have. Um, you know, throughout the rest of the game, it's one-on-one. -on -one, but this, you've got your opponent right next to you for the whole game. And it's you against him. So you can measure yourself. Um but then also it's a it's an absolute team effort, so it's quite good. And and who's the who's the toughest scrummager you've ever against? I see a little dog is running, <laughs> running around. Sorry here. about that. Yeah. No, what's the name? What's the dog's name? No, that's Niels. That's Niels, eh? Yeah. Hey? yeah. Okay. Right. Niels, <laughs> tell tell us who's the toughest uh, scrummager you've been against. You know who? Let me rephrase that. When you're playing against a team, who are the guys you say, I'm in, I'm in, this is going to be tough today? Oh, the toughest guy I've ever scrummed against was giving me a long back in the day. So, you know, with age, uh, age happens and then, um, you know, the things change. But I was a 20 year old scrumming against him in his peak. So, uh, my first year of super rugby. So, I, I learned a lot from him, um, you know, and I, I felt what it, I've, I tasted super rugby, you know, through his shoulders. So, <laughs> um, no, it was, it was, it was good learning and playing against him in the do, beginning. Do you chat afterwards? Do you chat your opposite number and say, gee, you got me there? You know, that's oh, from there. Yeah. Yeah, does that happen or in the, in the professional area is that gone? You still chat, but I don't think you tell him that you had me. So you chat about stuff that doesn't matter. Um, but Kevin was a, is a great, is a, is a great person. I really respect him. Out of all the players I've played against, he's most, Def he's up there for one of the best people um, that I've played against. So we would we would regularly have a chat after the game and ask each other, you know, non rugby questions. You know, how's life <laughs> and how's things going? So I've got a lot of respect for him. Why did you never go overseas? You, know, you must have had offers. I had offers, and you know, think again, things change in life. At a stage, I got uh, involved with business. Um, I still could have gone overseas. What business were you involved with? Let's let's go into that now. What um, business are you involved in? With I take Bloemfontein, uh, I take Free State. So I got in, involved with that. But even before that, I had opportunities, and before that, I just wanted to play for the box. And then I got that taste in two thousand and eight, and I just couldn't let that go. So um, I, because I was left out of the squad then as well, and you know, I, I always wanted to play for the box. But but. Virtually every player in South Africa is like that, and virtually every player goes overseas. Mm. I mean, now, is it fair to say you'll never play rugby overseas? It's fair to say I'll never play overseas. You know, I've thought about going to, say, Japan or somewhere for two, three months mm. just to experience something. But to go overseas and play there, I, I, I don't believe I would, would ever have done that, and I, and I won't do it now. I'm, again, there's a lot of reasons. There's not one reason. One of them is I'm, I'm too comfortable here. I'm enjoying life here. Well, you're in a so. beautiful house here. I mean, this house is magnificent, eh? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm loving it here in South Africa. So it would be difficult and it would be a big change for me to go overseas. But throughout my career, there's been a lot of different reasons. Not different reasons, but supplementary reasons as well. Business, when I was younger, and, you know, throughout till uh, right up to now, the, the bok, my bok dream mm. was, was the most important 
business family it's it's always difficult but especially at a younger age you know with say before 27 28 mm. i think it was it was actually a good opportunity to go overseas with your family so um yeah it, the supplementary reasons vary but i, I was never too keen to go, and, to go are, are you a um instinctive decision maker or do you analyze and sit and and go through things and weigh things up or do you say to hell with it i'm gonna go no i'm very analytical so you know i'll, I'll think about it i'll think about it quite a lot and then then make the decision on based on that are you good with money? Are you good? You mentioned businesses and, and there was a bit of a reputation. I know, I know the media sort of that you were someone who had a lot of other interests rather than, than, than rugby. You weren't just solely involved in rugby. Are you good with money? I wouldn't say I'm good with money. I don't actually know what that means. But um, I had the opportunity to go work for, for ITEC Free State um, seven, eight years ago. And the people involved there was Andre Fenter and Chris Barnos. Now, they ah. both played for... for for South Africa and I played against them many times both of them yeah I hear they were tough tough very very fast people yes yes they're still tough cookies but um even in the boardroom but um so yeah I I, I gave Chris a call actually he was in Namibia asked him about the industry and said that I have an opportunity and he said no I must come see him and then I started doing sales and started in the back office there so between rugby between training sessions I'd go there and I'd work so the people at work don't see you often. They see you one day a week, but that's your off day. So at the end of the day, you don't have any any off days. But um, yeah, I worked quite hard for a couple of years. And but did I you enjoy. The did, I was going to say, did you enjoy it? Do you think? Do you think? Do you think that's given you a platform for life after rugby? Totally, totally. I think it also changed my pers- perspective, and um, it keeps you grounded as well. You know, it it, it keeps you grounded, and it gives you a totally different perspective than. And what I believe some of the guys have that play rugby that they don't study or they don't, you know, work somewhere. Because you, you studied, you went to Tuckies, eh? I went to Tuckies, but I didn't finish. Yeah. Um, I started off because I, I actually got included in the in the bull squad a lot earlier than I thought. So yeah. it made it quite difficult. No, of I course. Think. I don't know how anybody, anybody could study. Tell us about Gray College. I mean, because the minute you mention it, you know, people go all dewy-eyed, this great rugby yeah. nursery, etc. What was different? What was it like being a, a rugby player at Gray? Yeah, you know, it was an amazing experience, you know. I think um, for me, the, the tradition and all of that really gives the place a spirit of its own. And... Um, on the field, you know, you and especially as a schoolboy, you, you get motivated motivated by that so much, and it's also great to have all your mates and a thousand guys sitting next to the field cheering for you. So that's the first um, encounter with that that I had, you know, as growing up in, in in rugby, you know. So it's it's a big every game you play for the first day. It's a massive game. It's so important, and there's this aura around. The, around the great jersey that you can feel while you're wearing it. Is it not a bit unfair to people who are maybe not great rugby players that they're, they're, they're second citizens? I mean, you know, do you ever think about that? You're a dad now, you know, what if your your your, your beautiful daughter is not a, a good sportswoman and she goes to a school? You know, you, 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 you change. Do you look back and say it's unrealistic? No, it's definitely not unrealistic. I was a C team player in, in standard six or under 14. So, and I enjoyed it just as much. And I remember as a, grade three i think or standard one boy i don't know what other grade three boys have that ambitions but i only wanted to be an actuary my whole life because i loved maths and um you know even with that in mind and playing for the c team i really loved gray you know as a rugby player and you know as as just a guy hanging around what, there when when did you realize from a c team player that you could actually be a professional rugby player? Was it a, a game? Was it a moment? Was it a conversation? Look, I, I always loved the game. So whether I was playing C or A team, I always worked hard and mm. fought hard. But um, it was through opportunity that someone handed me, you know, through through teachers giving me the opportunity to play and play more. Um, if, they, if they didn't do that, you know, even if I had the passion, it, it would have died because they gave me the opportunity to play. In standard eight, grade ten now, um, near Marx, Mr. Marx, he chose me for the under sixteen A team. We were always okay. I was always uh, in the primary school. I was centre, yeah. sometimes fly off and all. So of that. somebody told me you were a good goal kicker. Is that true? I was a goal kicker, matric as a hooker, yeah. So and why did you give it up? I, I don't think it was my choice. I think you know the kickers around me just got better, and uh, yeah, uh, I don't think. Um, it doesn't look great when a number two kicks for goals. And, you know, I need that time to catch my breath after every... You, you, you say you're, you, you love maths. 
Now, not many. Well, in fact, front row forwards have a great tradition. We were talking about a famous uh, nuclear physicist called Ray McLaughlin and that Philip Orr, an Irish prop I mentioned who sat on a wall. <laughs> he had a, a, a degree in maths, honours degree in, in maths. How do line-out calls work today? <laughs> Without giving any secrets away. Because in my day, you had maybe three calls. So one, you know, front, middle, back. The <laughs> jumper had a signal to the uh, thrower of a particular type of ball he would yeah. take, lobbed or flat or whatever. And that was basically it. And our scrum half, I called them. Nowadays, it seems like you need a computer to work out the lineouts. Give, give us an insight into lineouts. Yeah, it is. You know, it, 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 there's a lot of calls these days. Um, and I call Luit Da Vinci at the union because he's always trying to make the calls as difficult as possible. It, <laughs> it, it takes a week to study them and then he changes them next week. So um, there's usually a bit of a structure around channel. Um, the front, uh, every single jumper is got a channel and yeah then, you know there's they because there's so many calls they try to to build a structure around you know certain calls say a one is is where that guy goes forward two on the spot three backwards yeah but then you've also got the four where he spins through or he spins to the back and you've got the double spins and and then there's always that one or two movements for you know a specific weekend where you've analyzed teams that that you keep in the back pocket mm. if things go wrong and they've got different names and then as you walk into the lineouts, the guys can line up differently to than what you expect or they can move around. It depends on what your opposition does. If they man watch you or they check their opposition, then you've got a certain calling system that works better. If they move off that and they, they chase around quite a bit, then different calls work. So then there's a couple of special calls with special names. That'll usually be gin or vodka. It'll usually yeah, be some yeah, drink. Yeah. Um, rugby players, not. I don't think the initiative is <laughs> too much. So. Imagination, yeah, not so imagine, great. Yeah. Imagination is yeah. not that great. So it'll always be a drink or something. And But there's a lot of calls. There's a lot of calls. And the locks work hard to, to, to do, analyze. Do you, do you take it from them? I mean, in, in, in my day, when I played, the hooker threw the ball in and the lock jumped at the ball or the, the jumper jumped at the ball. Do you take it from him? Does he go forward and jump and you expect it to find him? It, it differs. You know, some balls, especially from the middle and a bit backwards, you throw first um, and then he jumps into it because there's a bit of time on the ball. But then you also get, and, and that's something that I know Victor actually started, where the hooker throws the ball first um, on, uh, on the back ball. He can trigger it as well. So it, it depends on what how the lock wants the ball. If he wants it flat, if, and that's probably when he expects someone chasing him from behind when the opposition lock is lined up behind him, or when he wants it in a bit of a, bit of a time ball with yeah. good shape. And that's usually when the position is right next to him um, or a bit in front of him or the position is facing him. So then the, the opposition will always be late on the throw. But when the opposition is looking at the hooker, you'll probably trigger it. The lock will probably so trigger the movement. It's, un it's unbelievable. I mean, it's like yeah. a degree course uh, all, all, all on its own. What is it like when you've had, you know, 17 phases of play, it's in the 70th minute and you suddenly have a line out on your own line and you've got to think of all this thing? I mean, that's fitness, isn't it? Being able to put that all together and get it right under those circumstances. It is. Luckily, I don't panic quite easily at the lineouts. It doesn't always look like that. But I've just learned, you know, if, if I make a mistake and throw it over, I just put my hands in the air and act if it's a, if, as if it's the lock's fault. And, um, <laughs> that works quite well. But but you must have practiced for years, your throwing, because you're known as one of the best throwers in the game. I did. I, I worked with John McFarland at the Bulls when Donnie mm. Kutsia and Gary Buerta were still there. As an 18-year-old, we threw basically the whole day every day um at a lollipop and and there was i think he was the first guy to use the lollipop especially or in south africa he was definitely the first so you know we threw at that lollipop for hours and hours and i think that really molded me and 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 helped me to to realize what's the fundamentals and how important rhythm is and all of that well, I saw you in Christchurch because I was there with, with, with Vodacom Red and the pra you know, beforehand and it was raining. Yeah. I mean, your throwing was, was absolutely amazing. Going from the Bulls to the Cheetahs and back to the Bulls, what, 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 what makes your decision? It was, I got opportunity for, and Rassi was actually the coach at the, or to start off, you know, I got the opportunity to play yeah, at the Bulls right after school. Um, I really enjoyed that. That mm. was some of the best three years of my life. And I was a junior, but I played one year of Super Rugby at the age of 20 with, with the guys that I looked up mm. to. And there was the environment, the the, the, the climate in the whole union. It, it was special. So I actually, I was teary when I left, literally. Um, and, and, and I cried when I Why, why did you go? 
I got the opportunity from from Rassi and you know also but, but is that was, is that when you say the opportunity is that a, a contract that says I can make more money or is it a, a guarantee that you'll play more or you know give me more to be honest with you I I think 90% of the contracts I signed I signed for less that I could have had but um no less money though no I, I think it, it offered me opportunity to play a bit more um, seeing at that stage Gary was a hooker mm. he was still quite young um, I was playing coach Heineke really gave me a good opportunity and he backed me as well but Chili Boy uh, Chili Boy was here as well and he was moving on to the box scene um, and I think he was he captained the box for a game or two that year or the next and I know that was a plan mm. for him so I was actually I was I was um, playing ahead of him back then but for me, it was about playing time then and getting opportunity to play some. And then going back to the the Bulls. Um, going back to the Bulls, uh, I think up, uh, after eight years, uh, I thought it was necessary to to change it up a bit and, and just get that. Bit get of out of a rut. Damage. Get out of a rut, especially uh, oh, precisely. Yeah. Mm. So and and I enjoyed it, uh, and I'm still enjoying it. Um, John John Mitchell, controversial guy. I mean, I I know him well, and I I love him to bits. But he's you know track record of 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 sometimes fractious. Uh, relations with the players. How have you found John? Look, I've heard a lot of rumors before he got here, um, but I'm enjoying him. He's he's got very very high standards, and I think if you understand that, um, that that really helps to understand him as a person. He's got very high standards. He works so hard, tremendously hard. He's his his analytical process and all of that is is really in order. And um, you know, he's got high standards for every single player, for himself, but also for the players. And I think if you understand that, then it it makes it a lot easier. I enjoy working with him. The I intensity of it all. I mean, I know he's often said that that the Bulls are still battling to match the intensity of training in matches. Is that fair? I think we're a lot better now. Yeah, he, he's really tried to lift that up, and we we train with GPS systems, so um, we can track ourselves and see how we've grown. And to be honest with you, the guys are really working hard at that. But I, I think that the tempo has lifted, and you can see that on the has lifted. You can see that on the field. And on the training field, um, you know, the stats show that, that, that there's definitely improvement in tempo. When you look ahead, what are you now, 32, 32, 32, 32 yeah. now? I mean, I know players now can play a lot a lot longer. Mm. Where, where, where do you see yourself in five years' time? You know, players can play a lot longer, but it depends on the player. I don't think I'm old, but, you know, for the amount of rugby I'll play, that ne- doesn't necessarily mean you're, you're done. But mm. I've had eight operations, uh, struggling with a couple of needles here and there as well. So... I think I'm very close to finishing off, or I am very close to finishing off and, and, and retiring fully, and then going into the work environment, something that I haven't done on a permanent base, 8 to 5, but I've been exposed to that. And um, Do you have any ideas? Are, are you available? Do you have ideas? Have you Are, are you involved in, in anything at the moment? Yeah, I'm going back to the office in, 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 in ITEC Bloemfontein, ITEC Free State, but we've also got a lot of clients nationwide and, and so I know I'll be traveling quite a lot and you and Joanne when you say what, what is it tech is that high tech or high tech high tech what is that so we do office automation copiers and telephone and PBX systems and all of that so it, it's yeah, you know, it's 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 exciting I really enjoy it enjoy what I do but it, it was it was um, Butch James said to me it's not finding a job after rugby it's when you've run out in a world cup final in front of 80,000 people and, and to find a job that, that lights your fire. Now, you talk about business as though it lights your fire. Are you just saying that or is that true? No, I like the business world and that lights my fire. I like to be intellectually stimulated. And, and, and that is, I won't say it's the same as running, and running yeah, out in yeah. front of 80,000 people, but it's very exciting for me. I think people might find it very mundane. And for me, that's very challenging and exciting. And I like the psychology behind all of that. And so... It's, it's very. I'm, I'm actually eager to get into that world and, and you know see what I can do there. Isn't, is, isn't that fascinating? Looking back on your on your career, talking rug, rugby now, what would you do differently? What would I do differently? I don't think I would do a lot differently. To be honest with you, I, I made a couple of um, maybe made a couple of bad judgment errors. Not that I can think of now, but you know I've learned through every experience. So there's nothing that I would definitely. There's nothing I would do differently now. And and I want you to think about this. A young player who's, I don't know, Craven Week or just got his first contract or, or Varsity Cup, etc., who, 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 who's wide-eyed and bushy-tailed and wants to have a rugby career, what would your advice be to him? My advice or her? to him would be, or, or to her, was, would definitely be to um, 
if you love what you do and, and you're passionate about it, go for it 100%. But that doesn't mean you can't have balance. And um, I actually want to say you need to have balance. Um, and that is um, more specifically I'm talking about working mm. or um, studying, studying maybe, or yeah, studying yeah. or doing something. You never know what, when something might end, you know, when your career might end. Um, and there's definitely a lot of people, some people out there that, that gave it the all and put all of their eggs in one basket and they made it. But there's so many people that, that don't. And unfortunately, even if you work hard and you're so talented, um, it's not in your own hands. Injury can happen. A lot of things can happen. You can you can just not get that opportunity that, that you truly believe you um, you must get and, and probably should get. But um, a lot of things can go wrong. So keep that balance and um, make sure you get something outside of the sport that that also keeps you keeps you alive and, and that you're passionate about do you still play the guitar i still i still play the guitar I'm, I'm i don't get time for it actually so i don't play quite often it sounds terrible when i play but <laughs> goal kicking every, every now and guitar then. playing <laughs> i mean a lot, lot of surprises here i always ask uh, everyone tell us one thing about uh, adrian strauss that nobody knows or very few people know one thing um and it can be serious or, or fun, or, or you know, for fun, whatever for whatever reason. Not a lot of fun. I think something, and I told someone this the other day as well, that I'm really fascinated by science and all of that type of stuff. So it, it sounds very uh, sounds very boring, but it's actually quantum mechanics and and the way things work, and from black holes and and dark matter. So I'm I'm fascinated by. It. So in my if I've got off time or in, at the evenings, I, I I I read about that and I enjoy that. Um, what I do is I. I get in. I like to get into nature, so yeah, get to, yeah. So I like. I'm not a good fisherman, but I like a bit of fishing, a bit of hunting, um, just getting out there and, and and getting into nature. So that's who I am. Fantastic, Adrian. Thank you very much for talking to us, and all the best now. Thanks, John. I really appreciate it, and um, I've got a lot of respect for you. And it's a, uh, it's always great having a chat with you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. What a great chat with Adrian and Niels, his beagle. So interesting to hear his thoughts on rugby and on life. Follow us on social media, TSE Advisory, and subscribe on iTunes to get all our updates. See you next time. Cheers from John Robbie.